their corrals before the Lamb of God and sin. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. And all the saints and
video? Then give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. A teaching from God's Word entitled Glorious Grace. Out of the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 6, it says, To the praise of His glorious grace, which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Beautiful words from the apostle to us, teaching us how to have a merry heart before the Lord in the glorious grace of Jesus Christ. Let's take a look in the scriptures where it expounds on this glorious grace. Do you remember the story where Christ was teaching and he taught the Apostles that some among them would be there when the kingdom would come. And shortly after, Christ and Peter, James, and John were on the mount. And, the, and Christ's garments shone. The glory of God shone off of the garments of Christ. And there appeared Moses and Elisha speaking with him. And they were talking about the cross. You see glory coming on Jesus. But you see them expounding about what's going to take place in Jerusalem. It's no accident that that's where the glory is going to come from. The power of this beautiful love, the power of the bursting of the life of Christ on the cross and the blood spilling out would cause great glory to come to the earth. And Peter, James, and John were seeing it. And of course it said they were afraid. And when they were afraid, Peter spoke out. And uh, isn't it like human beings that when fear grips us, we should wait till it passes before we speak. But if we try to speak through it, we're out of timing. And Peter was a bit out of timing, but in perfect time to reveal something in the word of God. Of course, the father told them to be silent eventually, told Peter to be silent to listen to Jesus. But Peter said something rather unique. Let's build little huts. And in whatever training Peter had on this, the coming of the Messiah, he knew that the feast had something to do with it. He knew that tabernacles was the preparation for the entry into the promised land and the coming of the Messiah with the kingdom. So he, he out of fear said, let's build huts. But he wasn't too far off. It wasn't the proper thing to do, but it was the right idea. The glory was there, and the glory is always revealing the kingdom to us. You see, there is no glory without the king, because he's the king of glory. When we read the scriptures and we read what happened around this proximity of these events. We know that uh, Jesus, at this time of, of, of his ministry, was about to descend down and prepare for his passion. The miracles were winding up. The great teachings of God had, were pouring out like rain on the apostles and the disciples. But what was to happen next was a terrible thing. Lies, deceit, cunning. He was taken eventually to Pilate. And the word of God says Pilate found no fault in him. But the issue was, are you a king? Did you say you're the king of the Jews? This is the issue. Are you the king of the Jews? This glory that was on the mount is really what the kings of this world want. The glory that causes power, the glory that causes fame, the glory that causes service and wealth. And they wanted to know, are you challenging us? Are you really the Christ? Are you going to take our power off of us? Are you this king? And they brought this to Pilate. And Pilate said he could find no fault in him. 
And it's amazing how political Pilate got immediately. It wasn't how could I judge this man fairly. I know he's innocent. I find no fault in him. But it's how could I please all those around me that are going to invest in my position of power. And so Pilate sends him to Herod. And Herod, of course, greatly rejoices because he thinks he's going to become famous. The prophet will do miracles for him and his fame will grow. He's the commander of the prophet. But Jesus did cooperate with Pilate and did cooperate with Herod. And Herod ended up despising Jesus. And, they, and Pilate and Herod became friends and condemned the pure Lamb of God. The glory was now set in motion. It was pre-planned by God our Father and discussed by Jesus and his prophets in the presence of his apostles. The plan was now set in motion and the glorious grace was prepared to come to the earth. When we think of this grace and we think of Jesus revealing his glory up on the Mount of Transfiguration, we have to realize that nothing changes without this glory. It's the glory of grace that changes everything. When Jesus appeared there, he was revealing the kingdom that's to come. This is the glory that he's going to put on his people, on his land, on his nation. The fulfillment of his covenant. The beauty of his name. His love pouring out this glorious presence on the earth. In the word of God in Proverbs 17.22, it says, A merry heart goes good, does good like a medicine. And then it says in Proverbs 16.3, Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. How we're taught to serve him in word and in deed. We almost think that word, indeed, we say indeed. But we have to realize if we have good words and they're sincere words, deeds will follow. These were a word and deed. Words that deeds follow. Real deeds. Strong deeds. Deeds that glorify God. A merry heart is a result of tasting the glory of God. Herod's Joy in seeing Jesus did not come from tasting the glory of God. It came from indulging in sin. And it eventually corrupted him and took his life. And we see that no man can be established by wickedness in Proverbs 12.3. A man will not be established by wickedness. I don't hear anybody saying today, let's do a study on Herod. He's not established, and his memory is horrible. Worms ate him. And no man will be established by wickedness, so that tells us we should find out what wickedness is. We should find out the ways of wickedness. We should know how to avoid wickedness. We should know how to depart from it. We should know how to cast it away from us. We should know how to live rightly before God in integrity. Because integrity will keep us from evil and keep us from wickedness. Pilate had no integrity. Pilate was admitting that Jesus was innocent, but he had no integrity. His, his knowledge did not, he did not follow his own knowledge. He didn't follow the truth. He followed wickedness. And he led Jesus to Herod. When there's a loss of integrity in a person, it's like an explosion. Something just goes wrong. If a person has a breakdown in the truth of their life, that breakdown is a horrible experience within a person. It's a denial of self. It's a decision to commit adultery. It's a decision to become a drug addict. It's a decision to do violence for greed. It's a, some decision that's wicked. It's an explosion within. But the bursting of grace that the scripture talks about 
the glorious grace that, he, that the scripture talks about is a formation of integrity within us. It's a strengthening of integrity. When God's grace explodes in our life, we don't become concupiscent for things. We, we become strong in the love of God and in the ways of God and wanting to serve God and wanting to please God and wanting to know God. God's word's clear on what happened at the transfiguration, that glory took place. And God wants a transfiguration in our life. He wants us closer to the kingdom. He wants us to know the ways of the kingdom, the ways of grace, the ways of love, the joy of Christ. They followed him up that mountain. There was no way for Peter, James, and John to see God's glory without following Christ. They couldn't simply sit by and say, Lord, show me your glory. They had to follow Christ to get to that glory. It was word and deed. And their deed was following Christ. They were walking in his steps, following him. And when they come down from the mountain, there was a, uh, a great healing of someone who was having seizures and frothing. And the, fir the first healing of the kingdom was a deliverance. And that's what Christ will do when he returns to this earth. There will be a great deliverance in the earth and the devil will be cast out of the earth. The unclean will be passed out. You see, when God's people are caught up, uncleanliness will reign in the earth. Perversion will reign in the earth. Unhindered. Debauchery will reign. All manner of perverseness will reign. But when Christ comes down out of glory, and out of the glorious kingdom of his Father, with his saints and angels, with his elect, this perversion will be cast out. It will be bound and it will be removed. And those with integrity, those that know the truth and held it, even at the cost of their own life, even at the cost of their own tribulation and suffering. You see, Christ was in glory, but he knew a trial was coming. And he was ready to face it. And he went to the garden and he prayed. And he allowed his father to know that he didn't want anything to do with darkness. It was not his nature. And him and his father agreed it was not his nature. But nevertheless, thy will be done, Father. Even though that darkness was not his nature, he bore the love for the sins of many. With patience, his love was spread out into this universe to reach us and gain us the kingdom of God. We first, first approach his love by faith. Faith in the promises of God. Faith in the promise of a Messiah. Faith in the promise of redemption. Faith in that Jesus came to save us. And the Bible talks about the percentages of blessing on the promises of God and his covenant. He talks about 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And we know that the, the price of a slave was 30 pieces of silver. And Christ was bought with the price of a slave. The Old Testament prophesied this. And so Christ was bought as a slave and crucified as a criminal. And this blessing fell upon all those that would receive this mercy. This mercy of redemption, this mercy of God's promise, this entering into God's blessing and mercy. And so everyone who's washed by his blood is brought into his kingdom. And this great blessing of the crucified Christ, of the Savior who was crucified, brought as a, tied up as a slave and beaten, and crucified. His blessing came on us. And so we enter into God's, for his first blessing, the blessing of redemption. And then the Lord calls us further to his spirit to give us the great gift of the Holy Spirit for those that will be friends of God. The scripture teaches us about friends of God and of how a person that's a friend, if you, if, even if it's a weak friend and you nag at him enough, they'll give you something. And your Heavenly Father will give you the Holy Spirit if you desire it and you knock and you seek and you ask. 
And those that are friends of God, those that want to get close to God, those that are not satisfied that he redeemed them, not in the redemption, I don't mean, but satisfied in that they want to do something for Christ. They, they have been saved by the word, but they want to walk in deed now. They're going to walk in deed. They want to do something for God, but they don't have enough power. They need another blessing. They need help from God to have the power to walk with God and to walk in his mighty works. And this is the blessing of God. This is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that came at Pentecost, that came on the cloven tongues, the two flames that went up on one to be part of one flame came upon the apostles. And that double portion of the Holy Spirit could come on us. That Old Testament and New Testament blessing in the word of God, the Pentecost of Sinai and the Pentecost of Jerusalem, the Spirit of God would come on us and give us that double portion that we could walk with God in that double portion and know him in his grace and know him in his love. The great grace, the glorious grace of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of grace shedding grace on us. Open up the understanding of our heart. That beautiful gift of understanding, that humility of within, that humility that comes into the integrity of walking with God. When you have that integrity, that integrity is based in humility. And when you have understanding, your mind starts to muse on the integrity that's within Christ and on the understanding that's in Christ, how he's the chief cornerstone of all creation. And the power of the Holy Spirit then that overshadowed Mary, that overshadowed it, 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 for Jesus' birth, that overshadowed Jesus in the Jordan. The Trinity there approving and bearing witness to the Son of God. All three together at once, bearing witness to one another. The three in one. And this glorious grace now emerges from this thing. And how many people have you talked to that have had a true experience with God that said, when I was immersed, I just felt so wonderful. You could taste the glory of God in the acts of God. You see, when your word has deed, when the word caused you to get baptized, you're baptized. When the word causes you to ask for the Holy Spirit, you get the Holy Spirit. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit because it's word and deed. Christ is saying to us through this word today that this beautiful baptism of this Holy Spirit does something different to us. It's a double portion because we're receiving the great Holy Spirit as we're giving it to others through the gifts of and attributes of God and talents of God that he puts in our heart. Whether they're small or large, it's a double portion of God's grace in this world. And we are, we are accepted into the beloved. There's not going to be anyone in heaven that's not filled with the Holy Spirit. So you might as well get filled when you're here on earth. Heaven is a replenishing and refilling from the river of God, from the Spirit of God, within and without, of the blessed love of God, of the truth of God, of the light of God flowing. The light of God flowing, the love of God, the water of God flowing, the spirit of God flowing out of the throne, out of the Father, out of the Father's heart. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is so necessary for us. This portion of the Spirit is necessary for us to bring forth the word of God in this at work. We're not strong enough. How many ministers, no matter how long they've been ministering, come to the place where they say, they say to God, Lord, I'm not strong enough, help me. Just like Peter said, help my unbelief. You come to situations in life, you say, help me, God, I'm not strong enough. And the Spirit of God gives you access and strength. His might rests upon us and gives us. And so we have faith and we have hope. We have a 30-fold. We have the hope that comes from the Holy Spirit. The blessed hope is in the Holy Spirit, the waters of life, the way of God, the hope of the Lord's return. As we look towards the Lord's return, we have this blessed hope. So we have faith and we have hope uniting, and they lead us to the love of God. And that's where the apostles were that night in the garden when they fell asleep on the Lord. You see, 
The Bible said Jesus was exceedingly sorrowful. Don't ever believe that it's that you're guilty because you're not perfectly feeling a merry heart all the time. The sorrows of life are in the trials. And those sorrows, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would turn into a merry heart by the anointing of Jesus Christ and by the Word of God. And they will lead us to the love of God. The love of God that enriches us, that enlightens us. Oh, love. Who doesn't want love? The greatest, most popular songs ever sang were about love. The greatest stories ever written were about love. If love's not in it, it fails. Love is the one element that makes everything not fail. And the one thing we know about Jesus, the one thing we can be sure about Jesus, is he's a God of love. What was his purpose when he created this earth? What was his purpose when he created us? His purpose was love. And his way is love. He's the God of love. He loves us. He loves you. He's been watching you in your life, your whole life. He's been watching you since you were a baby and a child. He's been watching. He knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He had plans to put his glory on you and form a life around you, a beautiful life. And you might be saying, well, I'm looking around and it just doesn't look that way. But don't deceive yourself. Within God, there's such a blessed unfolding from the darkness to the light. Did you ever think about a child in the darkness of his mother's womb? An embryo. And when you see pictures of an embryo, it's so sometimes grotesque and distorted. You say, how could this make a beautiful human being? This could come out to be a beautiful woman or a handsome man. And it's a distorted piece of flesh in a womb. But that distorted piece of flesh has the glory of God in it. It has a spark of life in it. And it will take the darkness. The word of God said, I'm gloriously wrought in the darkness of my mother's womb. And that glory within uncovers and molds that darkness and forms us in the womb. And that child gets more and more beautiful, more and more beautiful as it grows in life. And the parents are amazed at every step of that child. Look, he's an inch taller. Oh, aren't you getting handsome? Oh, aren't you beautiful? Oh, isn't your hair nice? as the glory emerges from where God put it. There was a verse of scripture in the Old Testament where the Lord called his people Jezurun, my beloved. Just like it said in this scripture here. His beloved, Jezurun. Israel, my Jezurun, my beloved people. I formed you in the womb. I loved you before you were brought forth from your mother. When God created the universe in the book of Job, it said, out of the womb, out of the womb came the waters. There was a, there, in God, there was a great gushing of waters where waters came forth before this creation was made. And then this creation was formed within those waters, just like we were formed in our mother's belly. No wonder Christ said that you must be born again. He used birth as an analogy so many times in the scriptures. You know, it seems like when Christ used analogies, when the people that can't interpret the Bible, they want it to be specific so they could prove it wrong. When he used specific, they wanted it to be an analogy so they could prove it wrong because they can't interpret the word of God. I've heard people criticize scriptures. They don't understand them. Just a little seed caused that child to be born. Remember when Christ said, if you have faith as small as the smallest the seeds of mustard seed. And so many have criticized that statement. That mustard seed was the smallest seed that the farmers in that Canaan land were planting in their gardens. And that's who he was speaking to. But the modern day scientists want to say, wait. A thousand years later, we find a small seed in South America somewhere of an orchard that's smaller than the... And they, they totally miss God's word. He was speaking to the farmers. He was speaking to what they plant. He was speaking to the earth they plant in. He wasn't saying his father couldn't make a smaller seed. He can. He made all the seeds. And Jesus knows all the seeds and what all of them do. 
and would all of them produce. And he was heralding the mustard seed because it produced so much for being so small. You see, an orchard might be a small seed, an orchid might be a small seed, but an orchid's a small little flower. The mustard seed grew, and this mustard seed grew big enough to carry birds in its branches. And it's a, it's a type of the kingdom of God, which will smart real, start real small in us, but it'll grow big. It'll grow big that our life will be able to help the lives of others, give them rest in our branches, in the prayers of our life. That we'll be able to minister to many. You can minister to many. The kingdom of God's within you. Do you want to be a hundredfold Christian? Not only give this word out, but give it out in such a way that the miracle of reproduction takes place in the earth because of you. The creator God starts changing the earth because of your prayers, because of your life, and because of your words. You see, a seed has to die when it falls to the ground to grow something. And when your life is given to that point, a hundredfold, where it's willing to deny itself fully for Christ and pick up your cross and follow him, just like the apostles left the glory to go down into Jerusalem with him. But only John made it up that hill. One wasn't even there and didn't even see the glory. But the love led John. John took it a step further. John took it to the love. It didn't matter to John if he was slain by the Romans up there at Calvary. He went up. His love led him up there. And it's a testimony in his soul. And God is leading us and he's saying, there's many people in this world that didn't seem to have great lives, that didn't seem to impress anybody. They didn't seem to do much. But it might have been a little old lady. It might, it might have been a little old man working in his garden. It might have been somebody that worked in a mill just forging steel. But love formed in his heart and he was willing to be a sacrifice for the people he loved and his love was a sacrifice. And he won the victory of a hundredfold. We're going to be so surprised when we see the people that won the victory of a hundredfold in heaven. Many of the ones that even preach this word of God, and I pray God never lets me fall into a snare of not being word and deed. I seek the Lord constantly. Lord, I want to do what your word says for me to do. I don't want to just say it. And, and Lord, you said over and over and over again in that word, you don't like hypocrites, Lord. Check me every time. I'm expecting something from someone and I myself won't do the same thing. Or I'm putting something on someone that shouldn't be on them. Or I'm not believing properly. Any hypocrisy. You see, the nature of sin is hypocrisy. Pilate was a hypocrite. He found no fault in Jesus. And yet he condemned him to death by turning him over to those that wanted his life. He took part. He washed his hands. But not indeed. Not indeed. He said he washed his hands, but he did it. He turned them over to his death. How many people walk with God religiously and wash their hands of the gospel? Oh, I don't talk about those things. Well, the Bible says you're supposed to live a moral life. Oh, I don't, I don't read that today. I mean, you can't argue uh, politics and religion. You can't, you got to stay. Things change. They think God's holy word has changed. You know, there's a lot of things that culture has changed. But one thing that has never changed is the truth. The methods of serving God have changed. Some of the traditions have changed. But the nature of the Holy Spirit will never change. The nature of Christ will never change. The nature of the Father will never change. This is the doctrine of Christ. He's holy. He will always be holy. He will never be an adulterer. He will never be a liar. He will never be perverse. He is God Almighty. He is holy and He is true. He is the essence of integrity. He holds everything in the universe together in Himself. He's the oneness of the universe. We could come up with philosophies. We could come up with all kind of manner of religions to try to, to, try to show how intelligent uh, we could be. And I've heard somebody not too long ago say they're beyond the Bible. And they get so progressive 
Their mind is so proud, they're lost in their darkness. They don't know God does not change. God does not change. His nature never changes. This book, it's been touched by many hands, but the nature of Jesus Christ, the Father and the Son, has never been changed in this book. And no matter what mistakes they might write with an and or a but or an or or a dot, the Bible always flows right through it and corrects. The Word of God corrects man's errors in this book. And they always flush off. Just like slag off molten steel. This is the molten steel. This is the Word of God. It cannot change. It never changes. It's always the truth. You can get man to write an interpretation. It's no good. But it will be found erroring by the Word of God. When you match it up. God's matching words in our hearts. He's framing his word in our heart. And, the, and the, a lie cannot stand. Jesus will stand forever. But a lie will never stand. God's holy gospel is presented to us. in the pay. He says, lo, I come in the volume of a book that is written of me. This, this volume of the book he's coming in today. Don't let people criticize the Bible. Don't let them say uh, the, this word has an error in it. Don't let them point out their own interpretations. He's in this book and he's coming out. He's, he may be wrapped in swaddling clothes in this book. It was carried by man and sometimes interpreted by man. It was carried. Jesus was born in swaddling clothes. There's swaddling clothes wrapping Jesus in this book. But I want to tell you something. The whole, the truth of God, all that God wanted to reveal is in this book. And no swaddling clothes is going to hold back Jesus Christ from raising from the dead. Amen. Jesus. We love never fails.
He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. 
jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane, I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. And I love. I love your presence. I love, I love. I love your presence. I love, I love. I love your presence. I love, I love. I love you, Jesus. Oh, we love you, Jesus. This is all for you. We come before you. Let me share with you how you could receive this glorious grace, this love of Jesus provided for you. By God our Father. Jesus made a promise to us that if we would accept him, that, we would, that he would take us to heaven with him. That where he is, we would be also. He died on the cross and that cross became a doorway to heaven. It became the open door to bring us into heaven. God the Father hears the nails pounded into Jesus' hands. The knocking is the knocking on the door to let you in. This cross paid the way for the door to open for you to go into the kingdom of heaven. If you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior right now, where you are, whether you're at home or on vacation or at a friend's house, just spend a moment here. Spend a private moment with God and say to him, Father, I accept your son, Jesus. I accept his love. I want to live with him. I want him in me. I ask you, Father, I, that Jesus would come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. That I would walk with him all the days of my life. That I would live with him forever. The, the Bible says that if when you pray this prayer, the angels rejoice in heaven. Remembering that Jesus rose from the dead, that power, if you prayed that prayer, that power is now in you to raise with him. On that great day of the resurrection, he says, I am in you, and you are in me, and we are in the Father, and you will raise with me as I have raised for the right hand of the Father. God bless you for that. Jesus now is your Lord. Live forever. Okay. In 1998, in this same month, we're now approximately and evenly the same day. And uh, what had happened was... Um, I was working in Michigan with the bowler makers and the Lord was about to change my profession. What he did was a miracle happened that was something beyond what I could ever imagine and I'll share it with you right now. I was attacked by the enemy in the middle of the night, the night before. And what it was, it was in a vision and I saw a huge snake attacking me in the back of the neck. And the next day I was wondering, saying to the Lord, what is that one? What's going on? You know, and of course, Christians bind the devil and plead the blood and all the things. And I was getting up to go to work, night shift. And when I stood on my feet, a severe pain hit me in the back of the neck. And my whole head was covered as, as almost like a steel helmet was gripping my head. I began to sweat, couldn't breathe, couldn't go to the phone and make a phone call and realized the only option I had was to get in my vehicle and make it to the hospital not far away. I had um, arrived and, and just flung the door open and was leaning and, and uh, uh, sweating and couldn't hardly walk. And when they saw me, they got a wheelchair. I must have passed out after that because the next thing I realized after that trauma in the emergency was a, a, a doctor. Uh, they had life lighted me and a doctor was standing in front of me. He was saying to me, you're going to die or be a vegetable if we don't operate right away. You've had a, a bleed. 
your spinal column is full of blood. And I couldn't give him permission. I said, you know, I was in like a childlike state, you know, and I just said, uh, you're going to have to call home. You know? And uh, during this interim of time where the neurosurgeon left and came back, I saw the precious Lord Jesus Christ, his feet descend into that place. And there was a beautiful golden light come off of his beautiful garment and out of his feet onto my head. And uh, they ushered me into an MRI and I was in there for a long period of time. Because in the MRI they couldn't find me. And when I come out of the MRI, the doctor said, you have all the evidence of a seractal bleed, but we've never seen anything like this before. The blood is draining into the ponds of your brain. We're gonna give you we're gonna give you five days in intensive care. Take all these tests again, the angiograms and all the tests again. When the five days was over, they, they one at a time, the neuro uh, people came in saying, this is a medical mystery, a medical mystery. Fif 10 to 15 days later, I think uh, it's a long time now. I think it was 15 days later. I had uh, been sent to Pittsburgh to Brajani Peru. And uh, Brajani, Dr. Brajani, the neuroscientist of, at that time in Allegheny General Hospital, told me that he, they can't find any evidence of a bleed other than the fact that my brain is uh, has the water aftermath of the bleed. And that if they don't get that out, um, what will happen is uh, there will be brain damage. And it does not come out on its own. It has to come out. So they scheduled to a um, shunt to go in my head. And I was at home and I was really upset about this shot and I was praying to the Lord sitting on my bed and I said, Lord, if you, and you did heal me, and you can heal of such a great thing like a cerebral hemorrhage, Lord, please don't let them touch my brain. Please don't let them operate on my head. And no sooner I got the words out of my mouth, I fell backwards onto the bed. I was out under the power of God. And I could see at this time the same light that I saw from the Lord's feet. Only I was looking into the garden tomb. My testimony is Gordon's tomb is the tomb. I saw the stairs going down. I saw the garment laying across a stone slab, the Lord's garment, and that same light that came on me in the hospital in Kalamazoo, Michigan, when that light was coming on me, bathing me. I woke up, fulfilled my appointment at the doctor's office, and Rajani was pacing back and forth in front of the pictures, plastic, big plastic pictures that they look at, turned to me and said, it's gone. This is John. He's 21. He's never met Jesus. It's possible he never will. He's already formed his beliefs. His heart is hard. He no longer believes God is good. He's not alone. You can share the gospel with them, and you should, but according to George Barna, what you believe by the time you are 13 is what you will die believing. After the age of 19, someone's probability of accepting Christ drops to just 6%, leaving John on a path to a Christless eternity. How do you change his future? Let's go back in time to when John was a child. He never went to church. His mom doesn't trust them. So let's find his public school and establish a Bible club down the hall. There, someone introduces him to Jesus, who takes his life in a new direction. John's so excited, he tells his friends, one of them comes to Christ. His mother sees the change in his life. When he asks to go to church, she comes too, and she comes to Christ. 
and it all began in a public school good news club. But where did that club come from? Let's go back in time again. This is Jane's second year with Child Evangelism Fellowship. See, I've trained her, created the materials to equip her and her team as they teach, and helps her raise support to work with children full time. Jane is not alone. Her church partners with CEF to host and staff Good News Clubs in two other schools. And around the world, hundreds of thousands of Christians do the same, evangelizing children, discipling them, and establishing them in local churches. As God transforms children's lives in Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and around the world, making the appointments and adjustments to bring the right person into the right life at the right time. Some he calls his children, some as adults, but for each he changes the line of their lives forever, threading them into a beautiful tapestry. This is his work, but he invites us to be his agents, to join him in taking the gospel to every child, every nation, every day, because today is someone's future, and this is how you change the future. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, then like and subscribe to our channel for more. Don't forget to check out our other videos.